Hello and welcome to Mel Make Stuff. My name is Melissa and this is the second episode in my series about Japanese knitting patterns. If you haven't seen the first video in this series, I will put the link in the description box below. If you watch that one first, this episode will make a lot more sense. Today I'm going to show you some progress on my hypnosis sweater and also talk about this little collar that I'm wearing, which is also from a Japanese crochet pattern. Since it's been some time since the first episode, just to give you a little refresher, the first pattern that I'm going to be showing you is the Hypnosis Sweater by Mikiko Gasnier. This is from a Japanese Rowan book, and the original sweater was in this pink color palette, and I am doing mine in a green. In the first episode of this series, I went over a little bit about how I chose to grade this pattern up because like many Japanese patterns, the original pattern only comes in one size. That size is a little bit small for me, so I explained about how I added stitches for I was working on the back at the time and now I've done the same on the front. So in order to size this up, I added a few stitches at the underarm and also a couple stitches in the uh, area of each shoulder. So I increased the width across the front and back by 10 stitches each. In the last episode, I also talked about how because I was adding these stitches, I needed to change the pattern so that the uh, these sort of sweeping lines of the intarsia color work on the back would be consistent even though I'm adding these these 10 stitches. So I had explained about how I went through this process of recharting the entire thing in Excel. I really have to thank commenter Karen for bringing this idea up because this was genius and saved me a ton of time on the front of the sweater, but she had commented that she would have just sort of highlighted some columns and repeated them instead of recharting out the entire thing and sort of smoothing the lines out of the design. And I was like, that is way easier than what I did. So for the front, that is exactly what I did. I copied the chart from the book. So the, the way that the intarsia chart is laid out shows you basically an outline of the entire front of the sweater. And so I just photocopied that and I highlighted some columns of stitches that I just repeated when I got to that stitch as I was going back and forth across the rows. For a pattern like this where the intarsia is very sort of painterly and not a regular pattern of any sort, I think that that was the perfect solution. I would have to do something different if there was a repeating pattern or if it had evenly spaced patterns across or anything like that. I'm not sure this would work in every instance, but for this one it certainly did. So let's talk in some detail about the front and the back that I have laid out right here. So here you can see the front and back laid out next to each other. So this is the back and you can see that the color work on the back dips down maybe to like mid upper back, whereas the color work on the front dips down much further. So it was very interesting to really have two different pieces to knit for front and back. I liked that aspect of the pattern a lot. This pattern only called for four different colors, but we have all of these sort of mid colors being created by holding two strands of different colors together. So you can see here, this is like the army green held together with that acid yellow, and we have the mint held together with the army green, olive green, and so forth. And even once we get up into this light, very light and minty green, area at the top. Much of this is knitted in just one single strand of mohair and other sections like in here are knitted with two strands of that mint mohair. And so we have this sort of interesting textural difference in some of the sections, even when there's not a color difference. Yeah, here you can really see we've got a single strand of mohair in this section and then double stranded here. It's quite interesting. It's very subtle and it's one of those things that you you sort of notice the more you look at it. Looking at the front, you can see the neckline dips down much further in the front, which is a nice feature. I think you can tell we've got more different patches of color, smaller areas of these different colors on the front as opposed to on the back. The front is a little bit more complex. So because this was intarsia, I initially was working with plastic bobbins like this and you would just wind your yarn around this bobbin snap it closed and you could just pull off what you need uh, because of the mohair 
uh, because the mohair is such a light yarn, I very quickly got irritated with a whole bunch of these bobbins just like clinking around on the back of the work uh, or on the front of the work as uh, I was working back and forth. And so I switched over to using butterflies. Uh, I will put a photo in here and I'll also link below to a little blog post that I used as far as a reference for how to make these butterflies. I found that very easy to, to work with and to pull off the yarn that I needed and I, they didn't get tangled even with, at one point I think I had 14 color changes going on across a row and I had 14 bobbins across the back, uh, 14 butterflies, excuse me, and none of them got tangled. So it was, uh, that was definitely the right solution for me. I enjoyed that much more than the plastic bobbins. Modifications. I took a little bit of length out of the bottom of the body. So in this initial color section here where we just have the two strands of the darkest green being held together, I took I think a couple inches out because I wanted the sweater to be a little bit shorter than written. And then I also added some length in this area right here because I think was feeling like I was going to need a little bit of a deeper armhole. I didn't want this armhole to be too tight and I tend to need a little bit more room in the armhole on a set and sleeve design in particular. So I added, I think about four rows in here, this area uh, below the neckline on both the front and the back. So these armholes are the same depth. And now I'm ready to go on to my next steps. The next step is going to be joining the shoulders with a three needle bind off. I'm going to pick up around the neckline and do a folded neckband, uh, ribbed, but folded over and sewn to the inside. I like that as a finish. And then for the sleeves, there are instructions in the book for knitting the sleeves from the top down, but because I added those stitches in, uh, and the armhole depth is now deeper than what's actually written in the book. I'm going to use the old trusty Elizabeth Doherty top-down sweater book to calculate my stitches and um, short rows for the top of the sleeve cap, etc. So I'm basically not going to be following the Japanese pattern from here on out, uh, just because that's going to be easier for me. The sleeves are entirely knit in one strand of this mint green. So I don't have to follow a chart in the book or anything like that. And that will be done, hopefully soon enough. <laughs> we'll see how long it takes me to knit two uh, single strand mohair sleeves. For needles, I am using some wooden Chowgu interchangeable tips that I just got to go with my regular interchangeable set. I really like these Chowgu wooden needles. You can see they have a nice tip on them, which is not uh, always the case with a wooden needle, but these I really like. Hey, so it's a couple days later and I was editing and realized that I never showed you what the wrong side of this sweater looks like. So I thought that might be sort of interesting to throw in here. Yeah, as you can see, it's been a couple of days since I filmed the other clips. So I, in that time, have sewn the shoulders using the three needle bind off and I just finished the neck and sewed the live stitches down to the inside. So this is still quite stretchy and I am not worried at all about this being able to go over my head. So let me show you what the wrong side of this intarsia looks like. So this is the inside of the back piece and you can actually see I think a lot better what those design lines are of these these changing colors. You can tell I've just got all of my tails, I'm leaving my tails a little long until I block this and honestly I probably won't go back and cut them off unless they look visible from the front. I can't see them from the front at this point or from the from the right side of the fabric, the public side. So I will likely just leave them around, I don't know, an inch long or so. And then here is the inside of the front. So you can see there were many more, many more little small patches of color here. It's much more obvious now that you can see the tails. And these textural differences are also a lot more obvious on the wrong side. You can see these areas where there were two strands of the same color mohair held together versus these areas with just one strand of mohair alone. So there you go. So now let's talk about what I am wearing. This is a crochet collar pattern out of this book. I will put the ISBN numbers of any books that I'm showing down below. And this is a book of seasonal collars. So there are 23 collar patterns in here that are both knit and crochet. The pattern that I made is the two-way scalloped collar by Yumiko Kawaji. 
and you can see they call it the two-way collar because you can wear it either this way oh, with the tie in the back the way I'm wearing it or this way with the tie in the front. Here you can see a very nice detail shot of what the sample looks like and here is my version. So I ended up using a slightly heavier yarn than called for in the pattern. This is a skein of Quince & Co Sparrow, which is 100% linen fingering that I just had in my stash and wanted to use. Because I was using a slightly heavier yarn and a, a slightly bigger hook uh, to go with this yarn, I eliminated a couple of these little scallops. So the original pattern has 18 and my version has 14. I think it turned out okay. Let me show you the back. I'm happy with how it looks and I, I don't feel like there are too few or too many scallops. Uh, it was really sort of a judgment that I made and got lucky with when I was, um, do they call it casting on and crochet? I don't crochet all that often so I'm not sure of all the terms but when I was um, doing my initial chain around the neck, you start at the neck and work down for this collar, I just sort of cast on the number that looked right and made sure it was divisible by the the wedge of the pattern repeat and just went with it and and lucked out so as you can imagine being in a japanese pattern book this crochet pattern is also entirely in japanese and as far as reading the pattern itself all of these patterns in this book at least are entirely charted and i found the chart symbols to be very intuitive even as somebody who doesn't crochet all that often and there are also sections of the book where it shows you very clearly with like drawn pictures what each stitch symbol means. If you are a crocheter and you have worked from charted patterns before, I would say you will probably not have any issues at all working from a Japanese crochet pattern that's charted as well. So while the charts are laid out in a very similar way to an English pattern that you might be familiar with that's also charted, like other Japanese patterns, these crochet patterns in this book also have a diagram laid out that indicates the direction that you're working with arrows, similar to the knitting patterns that we talked about in the last episode. And that diagram will also give you stitch counts, it will give you measurements, um, it, it's really just absolutely full of information. It's a fantastic way, in my opinion, to write crochet patterns. I had, again, no issues reading from this. So I'm very excited to try more Japanese crochet patterns because there are tons of them that are just fantastic. While we're talking about this book, I thought that we could look through it as a nice representative example of what you might expect from a typical Japanese pattern book. The Rowan book that I'm knitting that other sweater from is a little bit more stylized than you tend to see in, in most Japanese pattern books, and so it's not a great example, but this one is an excellent example. So let me show you what I mean. These books will tend to be laid out in four major sections. The first one, quite similar to many pattern books that you're already familiar with, will be photographs of all of the designs. The way that designs are photographed in most Japanese pattern books is extremely clear, which is not something that we get in a lot of English books as we all know. So as an example, this book gives a lot of flat lays, which are very nice. You can see the full shape of the collar and then it will also show it modeled. Same thing here and here. So this book is photographed very nicely. I just really appreciate this style of photography. It's very easy to see what the finished item is supposed to look like and they will usually show at least one modeled view. So that's similar to what you might already be familiar with as far as photos and views and that type of thing. The thing that I think is truly fantastic about the majority of Japanese pattern books of this type that I've looked at is that they have a page where they show you what all of the yarns used in the book actually look like on their own. So sometimes the layout will be quite cutesy like this. You can see bows uh, of each of the yarns used and they're all lettered so you can see uh, the details about the yarn. You can always use your Google Translate app to, to look at these details. And I love this because you can just see what the textures are of the yarn. You can see whether it's fuzzy, you can see whether, you know, some, uh, Japanese intarsia books will use, you know, strange sort of boucle yarn that we don't have access to if we're not in Japan, right? Or not, not easy access. And so it really helps to see what this yarn actually looks like so that we can substitute if we need to. This is probably my favorite thing about Japanese pattern books. Honestly, I find this so useful. I wish that other pattern books would do this as well. Then we have the pattern section and, um, as you can see, there will be very clear 
charts. Many of these patterns are crochet. We do have some knitted charts as well. And then the last section of the book will show you all of the stitch symbols in these drawn out instructions. So even if you don't speak Japanese and you don't want to use Google Translate for whatever reason, you can just look at the symbol and look at what it's showing you that you need to do. And so this is how all of the um, symbols are written out in the back of the book, which I also really like. So for the last part of this episode, I want to do a little bit of show and tell because I recently went to Japan and I did buy some knitting related things and I'm going to show you some of it and some of it you'll see throughout the course of upcoming episodes. So we went on this trip with a number of members of my family and so my sister and her family went and my sister is also a knitter. So of course we were excited to go to various knitting shops in the towns that we were staying in. The first knitting shop that we went to was Walnut in Tokyo. So this is Amirisu's store in Tokyo and we ended up going to the original one which is in Kyoto as well because it happened to be quite close to where we were staying. It wasn't planned but we we hit up both of them. As an initial foray into like a Japanese yarn shop uh, they had a fantastic selection of North American and European yarns. <laughs> it was um it was sort of funny to see like they had a way better selection of uh Brooklyn Tweed and that type of thing than I can find in my local yarn shops here. There were a lot of Jameson's type yarns and a lot of De Rayum Natura, stuff like that. And then they also had some Daruma yarns and some of Amirisu's house dyed like superwash merino sock yarn and that type of thing. They were extremely nice stores and if I lived in either Tokyo or Kyoto I'm sure that I would be there all the time but as a tourist I was looking for something a little more of a, a Japanese souvenir and so they didn't have exactly what I was looking for. One thing that I did buy at Walnut was some sashiko fabric. They had this really cool colored yellow sashiko fabric and so I, I sort of got a vision of doing a piece of stitching with some dark navy thread and so I managed to get the thread at a, a local notion shop that we just happened to walk by on the street. It was like a, a haberdashery type. In Kyoto we went to Avril Pepin which was an experience. I would have loved to be able to go back. We ended up getting there right as they were closing for the new year so that was like we lucked out with happening to go there right at that time because they were going to be closed for some days right after we went. And so they sell yarn by the gram. I think they sell it in 10 gram increments and they just have a wall of cones and most of this yarn is like strange textured, boucle, sparkly, like they have all kinds of sort of novelty yarns and then they come up with their own patterns and kits to use these yarns and like hold different yarns together and it's extremely creatively inspiring to be in this shop. They sold some kits and they sold some like small sample packs of the yarn and that type of thing. I did get one sweater kit from there and I also got a variety of these novelty yarns because I sort of had a vision when I was in there of using them in a colorwork yoke. Not all of them together but maybe one here or there just to add a little texture and I'm still thinking about that idea but I got a small selection that I can experiment with. Before I left on this trip the one thing that I wanted to get for myself on the trip was an interchangeable set of Japanese sized needles. I may have mentioned this in the first episode of this series but Japanese patterns tend to be written for Japanese needle sizes and some of those sizes align with the millimeter sizing uh, that we're all used to but some of them are in between and it's not like I need these needles in order to be able to get gauge. I can just work with what I have to get gauge but this was the the souvenir that I wanted for myself from the trip was to find an interchangeable set of Japanese needles. This was incredibly hard for some reason. Uh, most of the shops that I was going to either didn't have Japanese needle sizes at all or they would have you know a couple of different sizes of circular fixed circular needles. I was not seeing interchangeable sets anywhere until on the very last night we were there my sister and I were meandering around everybody else in our group we were traveling with a group of eight so it was a large group of people and 
everybody else was exhausted by this point, but she and I were still going strong. So we had gone and we're just walking around and came across a place called Nomura Taylor. It is unbelievable. They have both a smaller shop that's in sort of like an arcade shopping area. And then if you go around the corner, they have their big shop that's like four floors of fabric and notions and embroidery and knitting stuff, everything you can imagine if you're like a crafty person, is there. And at this shop, I found the interchangeable sets. Let's go over to the table so I can show these to you in a little more detail. So here is one of the sets that I got. This is Tulip brand, which is something that we can get in the States, I think sometimes. I know I've seen these needles before, but you can see that the presentation is similar to any other interchangeable set. Uh, they are bamboo needles and they come with the cords that you need and a little stitch gauge, etc. So I actually really like this one. It's cute that it's got the needle gauge and also this little uh, area where you can check your knitted gauge. I like that a lot. Got some gold colored stoppers for on the ends of the cords. Here are what the cords look like. You can see they do have a little bit of memory in them, but it doesn't seem super terrible. I think if there were stitches on these cords, I wouldn't be bothered by the amount of curling that's going on here. So they seem relatively standard as far as the cords go. Here you can get a sense of the tips of these needles. I would say they're maybe slightly on the sharper side of average. And they have the sizes printed on them. So both the Japanese size, which is uh, just a number, number four, five, six, etc and the equivalent millimeter size. So just on this side, I see 3.3 millimeter, 3.6, 3.9, 4.2, 4.5, 4.8, and 5.1. And then we've got some of the larger sizes up here. And then this is the smaller sized kit. And this one comes with 2.1 millimeter, 2.4, 2.7 and 3 millimeters. And then the other thing I got is also a set of Japanese crochet hooks. You can see they came with this little cloth carrying case. There's some notions and needles and stuff in here, a little ruler. And let me just pull these out. So here you can see these are also Tulip brand. The Japanese sizing is on the left and then the equivalent millimeter sizing is on the right. These seem to line up a little bit more with what I'm used to as far as crochet hook sizes. I do see uh, 1.8 millimeter, 2.2 millimeter, which is a little unusual. Three millimeter we can't always get here. Uh, tends to be more available in Europe. But um, I thought that this was also a nice souvenir gift for myself. And you know me, I had to get a couple of Japanese pattern books. This one is Amimono no to, uh, Knitting notebook. I got it because of this cover sweater. Just look at that. Lovely. So I definitely want to make this at some point in my life. This book also shows some of the designer's notes and swatches, which you don't always get, but I really like that. So this is a yoke sweater that's in here. That is this pattern. And I really like that the designer has shown the types of yarn here. So the body and the main contrast colors, you can see are knitted in uh, felted tweed. And then all of those contrast colors in the yoke are kid silk haze. So that's quite interesting to have that textural difference, which is not something I would have known just from looking at the sweater, but I bet it's more obvious in person and probably softens the color work a little bit to be using that mohair. I wonder if it's double stranded for the contrast colors. I have to look into that. But it's a beautiful book. I love this one. This one is called Matatabi Nitto. Matatabi Nit. Yeah, there we go. Mario Mikuni. It's listed in English on the cover. And I thought that this was very interesting sweater. Uh, there's a lot of interesting designs in here. This was one that's sort of more conceptual. You can see the photographs are a little bit more like the Rowan book, a little bit less just straightforward, uh, a little more stylized. Here, this model is wearing an entirely knitted outfit, knitted pants. The pattern for these uh, is in here. I'm probably not going to make them, but hey, you never know. This one, I think, is the sweater I am most likely to make, which is, it's just a plain sweater, but it's got this surface 
textural embroidery, which I find really interesting. I also really liked this one and could see making this. This is a uh, dolman sleeved uh, colorwork cardigan. So for this one, even though it does have those overly stylized photos in the front, it does give you this section where, again, things are shown very clearly, and I definitely appreciate this. Uh, you can see the very sort of kitschy, honestly, embroidery on this sweater, but I really like something about this. I don't know. It's, uh, I find it interesting. And then this is the third book I got, Daruma Pattern Book number six. This sweater is very beautiful. I love the texture on this. I think I saw somebody wearing this exact one. And then this is the one that I really like. There was uh, one of the people working in Avril Pippen had this sweater on and it's just lovely. You can see there's a very oversized yoke and there's a little bit of textural detail in the white um, like tree texture almost. Then we have this small band of color work and a very heavily cabled sleeve and body. I think this one is knit from the bottom up. I'll have to double check that but this one I could really see making. It looks, I don't know, there's something about it that's really appealing to me as like a cozy cozy garment and it looked beautiful on the person that I saw wearing it in the shop. So this is another one that I would like to make at some point. Here is the yarn page from this book so you can see sometimes they just show you what it looks like in the skein and this one which is from the Amimono Noto book is a good example of how you will typically see these yarn pages laid out. Oftentimes they'll just be quite simple and just show all the yarns lined up next to each other. So for something like this, you know, it's quite useful to be able to see this like funky, loopy, boucle type yarn if you're trying to substitute, you know, how would you know what this looks like if you just saw the knitted fabric? So I really love this feature of Japanese pattern books. So I think that that is everything I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.